No, your television set is not broken. This is merely our way of letting you know the birds is coming. <laughs> you more about this. The police will catch up with us soon. Where's the best place to hide? Robert! But he can't have come in that way. That door was locked. You could have let him in. This motel also has, as an adjunct, an old house. And in this house, the most dire, horrible events took place. Now, it was at the top of these stairs that the second murder took place. She came out of the door there and met the victim at the top. Of course, in a flash, there was the knife. And in no time, the victim tumbled and fell with a horrible crash. I think the bat broke immediately and hit the floor. It was, it's difficult to describe the way that the, the, the twisting of the, of the, well, I, it's... Good evening. It is a rare man whose past does not return to haunt him. My past is about to catch up with me on this very show. If you are interested in watching, you will be treated to a macabre succession of murders, mysteries, and crimes of passion. I freely confess my guilt. This burden of guilt I am pleased to share with you in the program which follows immediately. A man stands in the shadows. All we can see is his profile. Yet instantly we know who he is. We also know he's about to take us on a journey into suspense, mystery, and fear. But when the shadows lifted, we also see that our tour guide into terror looks more like Santa Claus than Satan. Such was the genius of Alfred Hitchcock, cinema's undisputed master of suspense. For more than 60 years, Hitchcock showed us the dark places in our minds, the evil lurking in the most ordinary of places, and the dread of an innocent person caught in the web of circumstance. But along with all the fear and foreboding, Hitchcock added moments of comic relief, often using himself as the butt of the joke. Ultimately, the respite from suspense was very brief, as Hitchcock quickly brought us back into his world of mystery, a world we loved to watch as long as it was just a movie. Hitchcock has provided us with never-ending fascination with his work and the highest level of film craft for future generations of directors to aspire to. Alfred Joseph Hitchcock was born on August 13, 1899 in Leytonstone, England, just outside of London. Hitchcock was the last of three children. His father, William, owned a successful produce business. He was a quiet child who liked geography, and by the age of eight had ridden on the entire London bus system. He also kept records of the arrivals and departures of British merchant ships. An often told story about Hitchcock's youth concerned the time his father sent a six-year-old Hitchcock to the local police station with a note after he had committed a minor misdeed. After reading the note, the officer promptly put him behind bars. He explained to Hitchcock, this is what we do with little boys who are naughty. Hitchcock claimed from that time on he had a deep fear of the police and other authority figures. A devout Roman Catholic, Hitchcock attended religious boarding schools and the Jesuit education reinforced his fear of anything evil. Hitchcock studied drafting and engineering and he also studied drawing at the University of London. 
Hitchcock got a job at a telegraph company where his artistic ability earned a promotion to the advertising department. In his spare time, Hitchcock was an avid theater and film buff. He was especially fond of Charlie Chaplin and the films of D.W. Griffith. He also took special note of various technical innovations used in theater and film. In 1920, Hitchcock got a job with the film company Famous Players Lasky, the forerunner of Paramount. Hitchcock's job was designing the title cards that carried the film's dialogue. Hitchcock worked on all 11 films the company produced in England. During his tenure at the studio, Hitchcock watched every detail of filmmaking. His first opportunity came when he was asked to direct the film number 13, but it was never completed. After Lasky closed its London shop, the studio reopened under British ownership. Hitchcock was immediately hired and received his first screen credit as art director in the 1923 release Woman to Woman. In 1924, Hitchcock traveled to Germany to work at the giant UFA studios. His exposure to films like Metropolis, directed by Fritz Lang, and The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, directed by Robert Veen, would greatly affect Hitchcock's future films. In 1925, producer Michael Balkan offered Hitchcock the opportunity to direct The Pleasure Garden, which would be shot in Europe. It was also at this time that Hitchcock became engaged to Alma Reville, a film editor with which he was working. The couple married in 1926. That was the same year Hitchcock's third and first landmark film would be made. The Lodger was based on a book that followed a Jack the Ripper storyline. The film starred heartthrob Ivor Novello. The plot concerns a series of murders that are plaguing London. Novello plays a mysterious lodger who arouses suspicion because of his nocturnal comings and goings. He's mistaken for the real killer and is hunted by an angry mob. It's here we see the first use of Hitchcock's trademarks, including the wrongly accused man and a breakneck chase. At the last moment, we discover the man is innocent and is saved from the mob. The reason for his strange actions was that his sister had also been murdered by the killer, and he was searching the night for him. Although the film is now considered a classic, the original distributor canceled its bookings, and it was only after a second screening that they decided to release it. The critics reacted immediately, calling it the best British film ever made. The young director was on his way. The Lodger also marked the beginning of Hitchcock's lifelong tradition of cameo appearances in his films. The practice started of necessity when Hitchcock couldn't afford extras. Here he is seen sitting at a desk with his back to the camera. The success of The Lodger also brought offers to direct in America, but Hitchcock chose to stay in England where he directed Downhill, Easy Virtue, The Ring, The Farmer's Wife, Champagne, and The Manx Man. Although these films didn't live up to the excellence of The Lodger, Hitchcock had established himself as an important film director, earning a salary of more than 10,000 pounds. He also became a father on July 7, 1928. Alma gave birth to their daughter, Patricia. In 1927, the sound era arrived in America with the release of The Jazz Singer. In 1929, Hitchcock had just finished shooting Blackmail as a silent film. When British International Films informed him they had sound equipment available, Hitchcock agreed to reshoot the film as a talkie. The problem was the female lead was European actress Annie Ondra, who spoke with a noticeable accent. Hitchcock's solution was ingenious. Since dubbing had not been invented, he hired British actress Joan Barry to stand just off screen and speak Miss Andra's lines while the actress silently moved her lips. How do I look? Well, now wait a minute. This isn't quite right. The plot of blackmail is both simple yeah. and effective. After fighting with her boyfriend, Alice is picked up by a young artist, played by Cyril Richard. After returning to the artist's flat, she agrees to model for him and puts on a flimsy outfit. Things get out of hand when the artist tries to take advantage of the situation. Later in the film, Hitchcock displays his grasp of the power of sound when the word knife is repeated to underscore Alice's fear and guilt. I mean, it's one thing to buy chocolates out of ours, but it's quite another to stick a knife into a gentleman. I must say I feel the same way about that, too. 
A good, clean, honest whack over the head with a brick is one. There's something British about that. But no. No, Niles is not right. I must say that's what I think and that's what I see. Whatever the provocation, I could never use a knife. Now, mind you, a knife is a difficult thing to handle. I mean, any knife. Mm -hmm. it's a knife. 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 Alice, cut us a bit of bread, will you? Knife. 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 Yeah, you ought to have been more careful. Might have cut somebody with that. Another highlight of the film is the final chase through the British Museum. Most of it was created using a trick camera shot called the Schuften process, named after a German cinematographer. The technique used painted images combined with mirrors and real scenery, a forerunner of rear projection. This also marked the beginnings of another Hitchcock trademark, the chase using famous landmarks as a backdrop. Doing here quick removing furniture that hasn't been paid for hitchcock's next project was the 1929 release juno and the peacock based on the sean o'casey play hitchcock and his wife alma worked on the screen adaptation basically it was a simple transfer of the stage play to film hitchcock would later say it had nothing to do with cinema at least my cinema to further cement in hitchcock's mind what he didn't want to do he was called upon to direct some musical scenes in the 1929 release, Elm Street Calling. Hitchcock said of that film, It was of no interest, it was dreadful. But for the 1929 release, Murder, Hitchcock was back on his game. The film starred Herbert Marshall in his first talking. Again, Hitchcock was on the cutting edge of cinema. In one scene, Marshall is seen shaving while listening to the radio. Since sound dubbing had not yet been invented, Hitchcock had to have an entire 30-piece orchestra played just off camera. Given by the Radio Symphony Orchestra. They start by playing the overture to Tristan and Isolde by Wagner. Funny that SOF coming on top of that other. Save her soul. Save her. If I'd stood out longer, I might have worn them down. Why couldn't they see the girl as I did? The rest of the fellows on the journey. Later in the film, he allowed his actors to improvise dialogue. It would be the last time Hitchcock would stray from his totally pre-planned style of directing. The policeman is still on his beat. Yes, I think, uh, I think we, that's about all we can do. Oh yes, we'll find out something. It takes us all night. <laughs> The Skin Game, released in 1931, was another Hitchcock attempt to transfer a stage play to the screen. The New York Times said, Hitchcock is never particularly keen during this production. His next film, Rich and Strange, released in 1932, involves a newly rich couple's adventures while on a world cruise. Although the film was weak on plot, it seems Hitchcock was trying to add more action to his films. Released in America under the title East of Shanghai, it was a failure on both sides of the Atlantic.
get out, Ed. We're going. The 1932 release, number 17, would be the last picture Hitchcock would direct for British International. About the picture, didn't it? Too much for my liking. Hitchcock then moved over to Gaumont British Pictures. Unfortunately, his first film for them would be one of his worst. It was the 1933 release, Waltzes from Vienna. Hitchcock said in an interview, it was a musical without music, made very cheaply. This period marked the only low point in Hitchcock's career because his next film, the 1934 release, The Man Who Knew Too Much, would establish Hitchcock as the undisputed master of film suspense. This tight, fast-paced drama incorporates all the now-famous Hitchcock trademarks, including something Hitchcock called the MacGuffin. Put simply, a MacGuffin is a plot device used to establish a storyline. It could be almost anything, but ultimately it's really not the point of the story, but rather a device to get it going. In the case of the man who knew too much, the MacGuffin is the knowledge of an impending assassination of a diplomat. Hitchcock used it to set up the story of a father desperately trying to free his daughter from kidnappers who have taken her to ensure the father's silence. Another Hitchcock trademark is the memorable villain. Here it's Peter Lorre in his first English-speaking role and just his second film. Is it all right in here? <laughs> Thank you. I ought to have mentioned it to you, perhaps. You should learn to control your fatherly feelings. Collected our brother's little offering yet, have you? Oh, sir, I forgot. Pardon me. Dangerous. The 1935 release of The 39 Steps was based on a novel written in 1915. Hitchcock rewrote much of it for a screenplay. The novel's writer admitted after viewing the film, it was actually much better than his original version. Hitchcock also considered it one of his favorite films. Robert Donat plays Richard Hannay, a Canadian on holiday in London, well, who gives are. refuge to a mysterious woman. May I come home with you? What's the idea? Well, I like to. Well, it's your funeral. Come on, then there's a bus. You want to know more about me? What do you think I do for a living? Actress? Not in the way you mean. Chorus? <laughs> no. I'm sorry. I'm a freelance. Not an adventure. That's right. This way. I'm afraid you'll find my sitting room all upset. Clear out, Henry. They'll get you next. The killers who are spies are now after Hene, who flees by train to Scotland. Later, with help from Pamela, played by Madeline Carroll, they discover the spies are transmitting their secrets by using a music hall act called Mr. Memory, and their plot to steal British secrets is foiled. The film won praise in England and the United States. The New York Times said of Hitchcock, he uses his camera the way a painter uses a brush. 
Madeline Carroll returned for Hitchcock's next film, the 1936 release, Secret Agent. Joining her in this adaptation of the Somerset Mom book were John Gielgud, Robert Young, and Peter Laurie. Gielgud and Carroll play secret agents on the trail of a spy. The likable American, played against type by Robert Young, turns out to be the real spy. Hitchcock, seen here directing Young, was breaking new cinematic ground in which the bad guy was just as interesting, or even more so, than the hero. Delicious. I hope you haven't been lonely. Oh, no. This gentleman and I picked each other up in the lounge yesterday, didn't we? Yes. A good angel threw us together. He's been most kind and entertaining. Mr. Roger Martin, isn't it? It sounds well the way you say it, but it's really Robert Marvin. Oh, oh pleased to meet you, Mr. Larkin. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Ashenkamp? It's not as well. Well, I suppose it's time now for the triangle to retire from the family circle. Exit, uh, baffled. I wasn't expecting you quite so soon. This floor makes my beautiful leg very angry. Another memorable character from the film is Peter Lorre, who, although looking like a typical villain, actually plays a bogus Mexican general and friend to the hero. Peter Lorre, seen here being made up, often missed shooting schedules due to an addiction to drugs. It's a testament to Hitchcock's fondness for him that overcame the director's requirement for discipline on the set. Strangle. Nice work. Neat, very neat. Someone very much did not want we should speak to him. That's what it looks like, doesn't it? I mean, uh, hurry up. You might be late. Don't forget it's got to be there by 1.30 at the late. Hitchcock followed Secret Agent with another spy theme picture, the 1937 release Sabotage. The film contains one of Hitchcock's most controversial scenes. In the film, actor Oscar Homolka plays a small movie theater owner who is also an anarchist intent on blowing up London. Fearing he has been discovered by an undercover detective, he gives his young nephew a time bomb to deliver to kill the police officer. The bomb has been set to allow enough time for the package to be delivered. The young boy is constantly delayed and winds up on a bus where the bomb goes off and kills the boy and the passengers. The suspense becomes almost unbearable for the audience, so as pure cinema, it works to perfection. But Hitchcock learned an important lesson. The public turned against the film because he allowed a young child, along with all the other passengers, to be killed. Although the scene was faithful to the Joseph Conrad novel, Hitchcock later regretted using the sequence. The 1937 release, Young and Innocent, returns to Hitchcock's theme of the wrongly accused innocent man. The screenplay was co-written by Hitchcock's wife, Alma. A down-on-his-luck screenwriter discovers the body of an actress, who he knows, that is washed ashore. To complicate matters, the belt from his stolen raincoat appears to be the murder weapon. The man escapes from the police and begins a desperate search for the real killer. Hitchcock aware of the need to keep the pacing taut, used a stopwatch to time various scenes. When the hero, now helped by a young woman and a hobo who can identify the real killer, take refuge in an abandoned mine, the floor caves in, almost killing the girl. To accomplish the shot, Hitchcock used Pinewood's largest studio and constructed the floor 15 feet above the ground. Later, the film contains one of Hitchcock's most memorable shots. With the police in hot pursuit, the trio find themselves in the ballroom of the Grand Hotel. The camera, in one continuous crane dolly, will reveal the murderer to be the drummer. To accomplish the shot, 
Hitchcock needed England's largest camera crane. Also, the camera operator had to constantly refocus from 145 feet to just four inches. Hitchcock needed two days to complete the shot. Again, Hitchcock displayed that he could successfully marry a good storyline with exciting visual action. When it comes to make that music pop, make you give it all it's got, I'm right here to tell you, mister, no one can like the drama man. Hitchcock was enjoying both professional and personal success. By all accounts, he was a devoted husband and a proud father. In August of 1938, the family visited New York. Although billed as a holiday, many suspected Hitchcock was interested in directing in the United States. Reportedly, both Pandro Berman of RKO and David O. Selznick had representatives meet with Hitchcock while he was in New York. He didn't make a movie deal, but Hitchcock's fascination with police procedure and crime led him to visit a New York police station before his return to London in September. Hitchcock began work on The Lady Vanishes. This 1938 release would prove to be one of Hitchcock's most popular films, and he won the New York Film Critics Award for Best Director. Interestingly, Hitchcock came to the project rather late, after the script and cast had been set the entire film was shot in a small 90-foot studio. As the story unfolds, we meet a young girl returning from a vacation in Eastern Europe. She meets a charming old woman on the train. If I were you, I'd try and get a little sleep. It'll make you feel quite well again. There's a most intriguing acrostic in The Needle Woman. I'm going to try and unravel it before you wake up. But after awakening from a nap, the girl discovers the old lady has vanished. The problem is that she seems to be the only person to have noticed the switch. Once again, Hitchcock delights in showing us what happens when a normal person is thrown into an exceptional situation. my friend. No? Um, my friend, where is she? Uh, La Signora Inglese, the English lady, where is she? There has been no English lady here. What? There has been no English lady here. There has. She sat there in the corner. You saw her, you spoke to her, she sat next to you. Maybe you don't understand. I mean the lady who looked after me when I was knocked out. Ah, perhaps it make you forget, eh? Well, I may be very tense, but if this is some sort of a joke, I'm afraid I don't see the point. Hitchcock's final picture under his British contract would be the 1939 release, Jamaica Inn. Actually, while the script for the film was being prepared, Hitchcock traveled to Hollywood and negotiated a four-picture deal potentially worth $800,000 with David O. Selznick. Hitchcock returned to finish Jamaica Inn, but it wasn't an easy shoot. The star, Charles Lawton, frequently stopped the film to discuss motivation. Although the film was not well received by critics, it was a modest financial success. In March of 1939, the Hitchcock family departed England for Hollywood. Later, Hitchcock would say, I wasn't interested in Hollywood as a place. The only thing I cared about was to get into a studio to work. And on April 10th, 1939, Hitchcock began work for Selznick UA Pictures. Selznick's choice for Hitchcock's first American picture would be the very English Rebecca. With a $950,000 budget, Hitchcock found himself making movies Hollywood style. But with all the money came constant memos from Selznick, who seemed obsessed with every detail of the film. Thankfully for Hitchcock, Selznick became so tied up with making Gone with the Wind that he finally left Hitchcock alone to make the movie. What is the mystery of Rebecca? What dread secret is hidden within the silent walls of Manderley? Not only in this room. 
in all the rooms in the house. I can almost hear it now. Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? Tell me, is Mrs. Van Hopper a friend of yours or just a relation? No, she's my employer. I'm what is known as a paid companion. Oh, I didn't know companionship could be bought. There is mystery, love and laughter in Rebecca. The motion picture still unsurpassed for suspenseful romance. The result was a triumph. The film won the Oscar for Best Picture. Hitchcock lost the Best Directing Oscar to John Ford for The Grapes of Wrath, but he firmly established his importance in Hollywood. By 1940, many British citizens had left America for military service in England. Hitchcock's age, 40, and his weight of over 350 pounds exempted him from active service. But Hitchcock's desire to help the British cause and Selznick's desire to make money coincided on his next film. Foreign Correspondent, starring Joel McRae, was shot one year before America's entrance into World War II. The film makes a strong propaganda plea for America to aid the British against Hitler's Germany. Foreign Correspondent was also nominated for an Oscar. Between Rebecca and Foreign Correspondent, Hitchcock's first two American films had garnered 17 Academy Award nominations. Hitchcock's next film, the 1941 release Mr. and Mrs. Smith, starring Carol Lombard and Robert Montgomery, was a complete change of pace. It was generally believed that Hitchcock did the film as a favor to Carol Lombard, whose home Hitchcock had been renting since 1939. But a recently discovered RKO memo written by Hitchcock, expressing his desire to direct a typical American comedy, has dispelled that notion. The results were modest, and Hitchcock quickly returned to his favorite subject matter, suspense. The 1941 release, Suspicion, marked the beginning of a successful collaboration between Alfred Hitchcock and Cary Grant. The film told the story of a shy woman, played by Joan Fontaine, who marries a handsome playboy, Cary Grant. After their whirlwind courtship and marriage, she finds out that her new husband is broke. Slowly, she begins to fear he's planning to kill her for her money. There was something strange about Johnny A's girl. I knew it long before I married him, yet you were always conscious of it. Conscious of something vague, restless, frightening. Nothing that's a murder could justify such a violent self-defense. I knew Johnny loved me as desperately as I loved him. And yet I remember now that even his reassurances seemed almost sinister. I want nothing but to spend the rest of my life with you. And if you were to die first, I... If I were to die first. From that moment on, my life was filled with fear. But the fear of not knowing, the agony of waiting, of wondering how it would happen, of waking in the middle of the night, shaking with terror, and finding myself praying that whatever it was, it would be done quickly and with mercy. The evidence before the crime. I wanted you to know, in case I met a violent end. The film is based on the novel Before the Fact, in which the husband is a murderer. But RKO officials refused to show Cary Grant as a villain. Hitchcock filmed an alternate ending in which Grant attempts suicide, but RKO balked at that also. Finally, the ending was changed to make Grant's suspicious action just the product of his wife's imagination. In one memorable scene, Grant is shown bringing a glass of milk to his wife. Is it poisoned? To highlight the milk, Hitchcock concealed a light bulb in the glass. Hitchcock received his third Oscar nomination, and Joan Fontaine won the Oscar for her role in Suspicion. Hitchcock's next film was the 1942 Universal release, Saboteur. Hitchcock originally wanted Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck for the leads, but budget considerations at Universal forced him to settle for Robert Cummings and Priscilla Lane. Although Otto Kruger forcefully plays the villainous Nazi spymaster, Hitchcock actually wanted Western star Harry Carey to play the role against type, but Mrs. Carey objected. I'm Barry Kane, American. Right now I'm a fugitive. A couple of days ago I was an aircraft worker. Then something happened. Something that could only happen in times like these. My best friend died in that fire. The authorities questioned everybody. I told them what I knew. I even offered to help, but it was no good. They wouldn't believe me. There were two detectives here a moment ago. They wanted to arrest you. They said that you killed him. That I killed him. You don't know 
what it is to be hunted like an animal, to dread every door you open, to fear everybody, even the one girl you could love. Even if a man committed murder to defend himself, maybe I wouldn't tell the police. But there's only one reason why a man commits sabotage, and that's worse than murder. We fled through 3,000 miles of terror from Los Angeles to New York. Step by step, the whole vast pattern of sabotage became clear to us. We had to find those saboteurs. Saboteurs who lived in the desert like rats and spied out the land. Influential saboteurs so crazy for power they were willing to stab this country in the back. Well, we found them, and we almost wish we hadn't. What the film lacked in star power, it made up for in lavish sets and exciting locations. All in all, more than 4,500 camera setups were used, including a $45,000 Fifth Avenue mansion set. Police, they'll grab me as soon as I open my mouth. But what are you going to do? We can't just stand here. Shadow of a Doubt, the 1943 Universal release, was to date Hitchcock's most personal picture and one of his best. Written in association with Thornton Wilder, Hitchcock effectively acted as his own producer as well. He took his cast and crew to Santa Rosa, a small town 50 miles north of San Francisco, to film exteriors. Hitchcock created the conditions that added a unique sense of realism to the film, even using many residents of the town in small parts. Joseph Cotton, the film star, said of Hitchcock, no director was ever easier to work with. The world is a foul sty. Do you know if you ripped the fronts off houses, you'd find swine? I don't want you to touch my mother. So go away, I'm warning you. Go away or I'll kill you myself. By 1943, Hitchcock had completed six films since his arrival in Hollywood. Every film except Foreign Correspondent had made money. He was still under contract to Selznick, but was lent out to various studios who were paying more than $9,000 a week for his services. Hitchcock only received about $3,000 per week. He did receive bonus money when a film was successful, and his total salary in 1941 was over $175,000. Hitchcock's next film, and one of his most powerful, was the 1943 20th Century Fox release, Lifeboat. John Steinbeck wrote the original film treatment about eight survivors of a torpedoed ship who must rely on the skills of a rescued Nazi U-boat sailor. Hitchcock restricted himself to shooting the entire film in one small set consisting of a lifeboat floating in a studio tank. The cast members suffered bouts of seasickness and eye and throat irritation from the use of oil blown over dry ice to simulate fog. Although the film was Hitchcock's smallest in scope, it took over a year to make and was his most expensive. Oh, there's a piece in here about some people who were adrift on a lifeboat for 80 days. Say, maybe we can beat that record. We might even get in the newsreels. Where'd you get the handcuff, Mrs. Porter? What miracles? It took me from the uh, south side to the north side. It's my passport from the Dockyards to the Gold Coast. It got me everything I wanted. Up to now. Lifeboat was Hitchcock's first American box office failure. Critics were divided. Some thought Hitchcock made the Nazi sailor appear too strong and resourceful, while others praised it as brilliant movie making. And Hitchcock was nominated for his second Academy Award. On December 5, 1944, Hitchcock traveled to England where he made two war effort shorts highlighting the work of the French resistance. He accepted only 10 pounds a week for his work. The following March, he returned to the United States to begin work on his next project, Spellbound. Spellbound united Hitchcock with Ingrid Bergman in the first of three films they would do together. Bergman had also been brought to America by Selznick in 1939, and she was enjoying great success. 
Spellbound was only Hitchcock's second film made directly for Selznick International. Surprisingly, Selznick gave Hitchcock great freedom in making the film, even allowing him to hire Salvador Dali to design the dream sequences. But the producer didn't allow Hitchcock to film outside the studio for fear of going over budget. Gregory Peck, also under contract to Selznick, was assigned to star opposite Ingrid Bergman, and Hitchcock was less than enthusiastic about Selznick's choice for the male lead. Yes, I mean, it, it would be if it were. After Spellbound, Hitchcock, along with writer Ben Hecht, began work on another Selznick project that would team Cary Grant with Ingrid Bergman. But in 1945, Selznick found his resources overextended when his production of Duel and the Sun began running over budget. To raise funds, he sold all the rights to the new Hitchcock project, including cast and crew, to RKO for $800,000 and 50% of the profits. With Selznick out of the picture, Hitchcock had the opportunity to produce and direct his first American film, and what a film. Notorious, produced for $2 million, quickly grossed close to $10 million. Hitchcock had pre-planned every shot in the film, and for Hitchcock it was this visualizing of each scene that represented the real making of the film. The MacGuffin used in Notorious involved uranium hidden in bottles of wine. When Hitchcock and Hecht first came up with the idea, they checked with a professor at Caltech to see if it was feasible. Unaware of the importance of uranium in the ultra-secret atomic bomb project, their innocent questions aroused the interest of the FBI, who reportedly followed the filmmakers for months. I'm sorry to intrude on this tender scene. I, uh, I knew her before you did, loved her before you did. I wasn't as lucky as you. Hitchcock's last film for Selznick was the 1947 release, The Paradigm Case, a project Hitchcock really didn't want to undertake. Making things worse, Selznick never left Hitchcock alone. Although the film features an all-star cast and a $4 million budget, it was a disappointment. Hitchcock tried his best to make the film work. He constructed a $70,000 Old Bailey courtroom set. In an effort to reduce the number of stops for camera repositioning, he filmed the tense courtroom scenes using as many as four cameras at once. In 1948, Hitchcock formed Transatlantic Pictures and Warner Brothers agreed to distribute the new company's films. The fact that a major studio like Warner's agreed to the distribution deal was a major coup for a small independent and demonstrated how important Hitchcock had become in Hollywood. With so much newfound freedom, it's no surprise that Hitchcock's first independent film would be so unusual. I just think we ought to wait till after you graduate. I don't. It's only a month. Janet, a month. Please. Sorry. I personally consider us engaged as of now. Congratulations. David, no. Look, you can say yes in a taxi. I have a 2.30 appointment I'm in your... staying right here. Oh? Trade, you'll say yes? I'll see you tonight at Brandon's party. Okay. You can say yes, sir, just as well as in a taxi. Goodbye, darling. Bye. That's the last time she ever saw him alive. And that's the last time you'll ever see him alive. What happened to David Kentley changed my life completely and the lives of seven others. Janet Walker, Henry Kentley, the boy's father, his aunt, Mrs. Atwater, his best friend, Kenneth Lawrence, a housekeeper named Mrs. Wilson, and the two who were responsible for everything. Brandon Shaw and Philip Morgan. The 1948 release, Rope, was Hitchcock's first Technicolor film. Rope was also the first major feature ever planned and shot in long, continuous takes. Sequences lasted up to 10 minutes, which was the maximum time a 35mm film camera could hold. The film was based on a stage play, and the story unfolds in real time. There are 11 sequences in the film, varying in time from five minutes to nine minutes each. Later, Hitchcock would say, 
I did it as a stunt. It was quite nonsensical because I broke my own theories on the importance of cutting and montage. The 1949 release, Under Capricorn, was Hitchcock's first feature film produced in England since his arrival in America in 1939. He signed Ingrid Bergman to an enormous contract to star in the film. Under Capricorn is a romantic mystery set in Australia around 1840. As in Rope, Hitchcock again used long, continuous takes, but the technique was far less effective in this film. Tension arose between Hitchcock and Bergman, who complained about the stress of doing long takes. At one point, Hitchcock exclaimed, Ingrid, it's only a movie. Later, he admitted that casting Bergman was a mistake. He said, all I could think of was returning to London with the biggest star of the day. I hope you haven't been giving too much thought to what I said about Miss Trudet and her ladyship in her bedroom. I'm sure it wasn't her fault. Well, she wasn't what you'd call responsible at the time. I know she wasn't, because she had half her clothes off and didn't seem to notice. I wouldn't go in there, Sam. I tell you she's had a triumph. You mustn't spoil it. Well, I see. I'm not good enough to stand beside my wife when she's with the quality. Don't be ridiculous, Sam. You aren't even dressed for a ball. Shock you came. Right. Sir Richard, may I present my husband? Oh, you're talking about horses. I was telling His Excellency. That I was brought up in a stable. I heard you. Well, my money's as good as the next man's. The compliments of Mr. Samson Plusky, Esquire. It'll pay for my wife's supper. Hitchcock never forgot the experience, and it was the last time he would allow the appeal of a star's glamour to cloud his movie-making instincts. The box office failure of Under Capricorn also brought the demise of transatlantic pictures. Hitchcock then signed a four-picture deal with Warner Brothers. Although he was no longer an independent, Warner's offered him great freedom in selecting his future projects. Choosing to remain in England, his next film was the 1950 release Stage Fright. Hitchcock had acquired the rights to the book after reviews mentioned it would make great Hitchcock material. He later regretted his decision, saying, like an idiot, I believe them. It looked like a rather routine affair. He hardly expected it to lead to the most dangerous adventure of his life, romance. The case presented a few clues and a few bodies. A very dead body, a very heavenly body, a very suspicious body, and finally, a very charming busybody who started out by getting tangled in the strings of the mystery and finished by getting tied up in the strings of his heart. The film starred Richard Todd and Jane Wyman and was a typical whodunit. But Hitchcock had committed a fatal error by showing the audience a flashback near the beginning of the film, which later turned out to be untrue. He said, I did one thing in that picture I should have never done. The flashback was a lie. Up the accident. Destroying that dreadful dress. I didn't destroy it. So long as I have the dress, I'm the one who decides how long this show will run. And everything else. Do you understand? You fool! There goes evidence that could have helped you. Well, you're not to say things against Charlotte. I'm doing all this for her sake. You're just jealous of her. Let them say if they like it's satirical. This sounds to me remarkably like blackmail. I think I'd better call the police. Yes, do call the police, Miss Emwood. We'll talk to them together. Who are you? Hitchcock turned to another book for his next film, the 1951 release Strangers on a Train. The project got off to a rocky start. Hitchcock hired famed mystery writer Raymond Chandler to do the screenplay, but after two rewrites and many arguments, Chandler left the film, and a new script was finished just weeks before filming began. But it was worth it, the unusual story of two strangers who met on a train and agreed to exchange murders really caught the public's fascination. Hitchcock's casting added to the film's appeal, including Farley Granger's strong performance. But the surprise of the film was the likable Robert Walker, who was cast against type as a psychopathic killer. His brilliant performance won praise from the critics and seemed to elevate his career. Sadly, Walker died in 1951 after making just one more film. For the 1952 release, I Confess, Hitchcock returned to one of his favorite themes, The Wrongly Accused Man. Shot on location in Canada, it's the story of a priest who takes the confession of a murderer. Later, 
The priest is accused of the same crime, but his religious vows prevent him from revealing the truth. The film was a box office failure, and later Hitchcock thought the script may have been too somber. Why were you being blackmailed? You don't care whom I hurt. Just so long as I answer all your questions. I only want to clear a murder. Caught in the tangled web of murder, three people confess the secrets that torture their souls. But in the echoes and shadows of the ancient city of Quebec, Canada, walks a man who knows the whole terrifying truth, but can never tell all the strange things his ears have heard. For he is sworn to silence. Grim silence that points the finger of suspicion at him. Crushing silence that brings him the contempt of the people who loved and respected him. A deadly silence that leads him to the 13 steps of the gallows. During the early 1950s, the major studios began to feel the negative effect of television on their box office receipts. In an effort to attract people back into movie theaters, various new movie processes were tried, including 3D. With the success of Warner's House of Wax, the studio prevailed on Hitchcock to film his next project, Dial M for Murder, in 3D. Based on a hit play and faced with the technical limitations of 3D, Hitchcock opted to shoot the entire movie on one soundstage. With his strong technical background, Hitchcock had little trouble dealing with the 3D process, and Hitchcock completed filming in less than 40 days. By the time Dial M for Murder was released in 1954, the 3D craze had subsided, and the film was generally presented in standard flat screen. Strong performances by Robert Cummings and Ray Milland helped the film score at the box office. For Hitchcock, the most positive aspect of the film may have been working with Grace Kelly for the first time. It's the best crime play in years. The London Daily Mail headlined, A Murder Thriller with a Difference. The New York Daily Mirror wrote, It holds your attention like a vice. What could you tell them? I should simply tell them that you're trying to blackmail me into... Into? Murdering your wife. Fantastic, isn't it? But you know he's right, don't you, Tony? You've worked it out to the smallest detail. And this man is to be your murder weapon for the perfect crime. And you, Margot, you've been living dangerously, too dangerously, a married woman with a two-party line to your affections. And Mark, ironic, isn't it, that in this design for death, you should be selected to be the perfect alibi for the murder of the woman you love. I couldn't possibly tell him. Not now. There is evidence, however, that he was blackmailing you. Blackmail? Yes, I'm afraid it's true, Tony. And you suggest that he came in by the window. And we know that he came in by that door. But he can't have come in that way. That door was locked. You could have let him in. In the summer of 1953, Hitchcock's agent, Lou Wasserman, negotiated a multi-picture deal for him at Paramount. It was really a homecoming for Hitchcock, as Paramount's origins went back to Hitchcock's first job at Famous Players Lasky. Not only would Hitchcock produce and direct, but he would also own all the rights to five future films. For Hitchcock, his timing couldn't have been better. His first Paramount film was the 1954 classic Rear Window. A surprised Grace Kelly received a phone call from Hitchcock requesting her to fly to Hollywood for wardrobe fittings. Kelly was in New York where she was considering an offer to appear in On the Waterfront. Kelly hurriedly decided to go with the Hitchcock project. Then Hitchcock got Jimmy Stewart to agree to star in the film for a percentage of the profits in lieu of salary. Again, Hitchcock found himself filming in a restricted space, but his earlier efforts in Lifeboat, Rope and Dial M for Murder paid dividends. Rear Window became a smash hit, and Hitchcock was nominated for an Academy Award. My name is Jeffries. I'm a news photographer, and my beat is the world. That is, it used to be. 
Right now, my world has shrunk down to the size of this window. I've been watching those people across the way. Nobody seems to pull their blinds in a hot spell like this. I know a lot about them by now. Too much, perhaps. For instance, down there on the second floor, that woman pacing about, I call her Miss Lonely Heart. So lonely that even death seems like a friend. Those are the newlyweds. On a honeymoon, no one will ever forget. The songwriter over there, over and over again, the same melody. A genius or insane? That's the traveling salesman and his invalid wife. Out of their arguments and nagging comes a weird kind of love. Miss Torso, the body beautiful, that is, viewed from a safe distance. Those are just a few of my neighbors. First, I watched them just to kill time, but then I couldn't take my eyes off them, just as you won't be able to. And you won't be able to take your eyes off the glowing beauty of the screen's most alluring new personality, Grace Kelly, who reaches the peak of her sensational rise to stardom in this story of a romance shadowed by the terror of a horrifying secret. For they had stared too long and seen too much through the rear window. In 1954, Hitchcock appeared on a TV special to receive the Look Magazine Award from host Red Skelton. Watching the portly and proper Englishman, it would be hard to imagine that one year later, Hitchcock himself would become a major TV star. In rear window and dial M for murder, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. Congratulations. This is a Look Magazine for this award. Thank you. You're very kind. You know, I saw Rear Window, and I think their choice was wonderful. And, you know, truthfully, I'm glad we get to meet like this. I'd like to do a picture with you myself. I've always wanted to do a picture that's serious and sad for a change. What do you mean, change, Ray? It's <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. Come down, Robbie, or we shall be forced to shoot. The 1955 release, To Catch a Thief, offered Hitchcock the opportunity for a complete change of pace from the tense, claustrophobic films he had been making. Shot on location in the south of France in luminous color, the film paired Hitchcock's favorite stars, Grace Kelly and Cary Grant. The storyline is typical Hitchcock. Grant plays a reformed cat burglar who has come under suspicion when similar jewel robberies begin to occur. The script is peppered with comic and sometimes risque dialogue. Grant, Kelly, and Hitchcock enjoyed each other's company immensely, and the result is one of Hitchcock's most elegant and entertaining films. ...into very close contact in this perfect tale of romantic intrigue, filmed on the beautiful French Riviera. You have a very strong grip, the kind of burglar needs. That's why you came out here, isn't it? The scandalous romance that shocked even the blasé international set between this restless, thrill-hunting American heiress and the notorious man of mystery called the Cat. For the game they played was not played for money, and the characters they played with played for keeps. No one but Hitchcock could create such relentless excitement, filling the screen with fireworks as he matches the blazing talents of these two great stars in the love affair of the year. Look, John. Hold them. Diamonds. Have you ever had a better offer in your whole life? One with everything. For this is that perfect moment in time when the magic wand of autumn touches its rolling historic hills and transforms them into a veritable wonderland of dazzling color. Hitchcock's next film, the 1955 release, The Trouble with Harry, was his fourth film in less than two years, and a disappointment. The film takes place in Vermont, and Hitchcock had hurriedly returned from the Riviera to take advantage of the fall colors, but bad weather forced much of the shooting back into the studio. The story centers on the discovery by a small boy, played by Jerry Mathers of TV's Leave it to Beaver, of a dead man named Harry Warp. Four different townsfolk believe they may have been responsible for the man's death. One of them was played by Shirley MacLaine in her film debut. 
After a series of comic attempts to hide the body, it's learned that Harry actually died of natural causes. Although many critics liked the subtle British humor, it didn't appeal to American audiences and failed at the box office. Perhaps the sweet old sea captain, who actually wasn't a very good shot. Or the New England spinster, who would go to any lengths to defend her honor. Or the enchanting redhead, who had been Harry's unkissed bride. Or the unconventional artist, who was mad about Harry's widow. Or the bum, who needed a new pair of shoes. Or the nearsighted surgeon, who liked to read poetry out loud. Yes, the unconventional Mr. Hitchcock has done it again, just as he did with Rear Window, playing a most unusual story against a new and different background, The Trouble with Harry. In April of 1955, Alfred Hitchcock became an American citizen. Later that year, on October 2nd, 1955, Alfred Hitchcock Presents premiered on CBS television. The brainchild of Hitchcock's agent, Lou Wasserman, the program was conceived to be a natural tie-in for Hitchcock's newly published magazine series. Produced in association with Universal's television arm, Review, Hitchcock's own production company, Shamley, received $129,000 per episode, with the rights reverting to Hitchcock after the first broadcast. In an era when many filmmakers looked down at television, Hitchcock embraced the upstart medium. Not only would Hitchcock direct many of the episodes, he also became its on-camera host. In fact, as early as November 1955, reviews called Hitchcock the best thing about the show. Hitchcock's outlandish remarks and open contempt for his sponsors delighted audiences. From the very first episode, Revenge, starring Ralph Meeker and Vera Miles and directed by Hitchcock, the program treated audiences to an outstanding array of established and up-and-coming actors performing the work of creative writers. There might be several explanations why Hitchcock decided to remake his 1934 film, The Man Who Knew Too Much, in 1956. Hitchcock himself said, Let's just say the first version was the work of a talented amateur, and the second was made by a professional. More than any other changes, Hitchcock's casting of Jimmy Stewart and Doris Day in the lead roles seemed to energize the film. Lush Technicolor and VistaVision photography, and a music score that features the Academy Award-winning Que Sera Sera, Hope to make the story a hit all over again. Hey, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Now you're right, that was the gunshot you heard. That was the signal that brought all the trouble out in the open. It's a scene from our new picture, The Man Who Knew Too Much. And Hitchcock has an uncanny knack for coming up with the unusual in entertainment, while The Man Who Knew Too Much can certainly be put in that category. I play the part of an American doctor, Doris Day is my wife, and the story is about our trip abroad that started out as a holiday and ended up as a nightmare. Hitchcock took us thousands of miles away from Hollywood to Marrakesh, which is right in the center of the North African trouble area. And that was just the beginning. From there, we flew to London for backgrounds of a whole strange series of events that ended up that final night in the great concert hall, where the cue for murder was one single crash of the cymbals. In 1956, Warner Brothers acquired the rights to the true story of a New York musician falsely accused of a crime. The Wrong Man, released in 1957, starred Henry Fonda as the falsely accused man and Vera Miles as the man's distraught wife. Hitchcock had worked with Miles when she appeared in the first episode of his TV series. Resisting the use of color or widescreen, Hitchcock shot the film in black and white on location in New York. Using a semi-documentary style, the film had such a frightening reality, it may have actually put off audiences and hurt the box office. In 1957, Hitchcock's production company, Shamley, was contracted to produce ten one-hour episodes of a new NBC TV series entitled Suspicion. Hitchcock was executive producer and directed just one of the episodes. Joan Harrison, who had been with Hitchcock since 1935 in various capacities and was producer of Hitchcock's CBS show, became the associate producer. Another offshoot of Hitchcock's TV success was the 1958 album 
Music to be Murdered by. The 1958 release of Vertigo marked the beginning of an extremely productive period for Hitchcock. Paramount bought the screen rights to Vertigo specifically for Hitchcock. To ensure box office success, Jimmy Stewart, a Hitchcock favorite, and number three male box office draw was cast. Kim Novak, the current number one rated female star, was acquired from Columbia to appear opposite Stewart. The film has heavy psychosexual undertones, and it's become one of Hitchcock's most discussed and studied films. It was exactly what Hitchcock was after. He called it icebox talk, meaning that couples would discuss the film while hunting for food in their refrigerator after watching the movie. The story of a love so powerful it broke down all barriers between past and present, between life and death, between the golden girl in the dark tower and the tawdry redhead that he tried to remake in her image. Hitchcock's contract with Paramount was non-exclusive, so in 1958 he signed with MGM to do the screen version of The Wreck of the Mary Deer. But Hitchcock and writer Ernest Lehman became disenchanted with the idea. Lehman suggested they do the Hitchcock picture to end all Hitchcock pictures. The director recalled an earlier idea suggested to him about the CIA creating a phony agent as a decoy. The result, of course, was the 1959 release North by Northwest, a perfect blend of suspense, action, and romance. All the Hitchcock trademarks are there. The wrong man, the chase, monumental backdrops, the memorable villain, and just enough comedy to break the tension. The film worked so well it became the prototype for a new breed of action-adventure films like the James Bond series. Cary Grant, running for his life, searching for a man who doesn't exist, and a secret nobody knows, and finding a blonde who has all the answers. Hello there. Tell me, why are you so good to me? Shall I climb up and tell you why? At breakneck speed, they race together toward the excitement that lies dead ahead, north by northwest. How do I know you aren't a murderer? You don't. Cary Grant, Eva Marie Saint, and James Mason as the man of sinister surprises. Apparently, the only performance that will satisfy you is when I play dead. In your very next role, you'll be quite convincing, I assure you. The perfect setup for suspense. With the perfect woman and the perfect crime, as Alfred Hitchcock takes you north by northwest. Back on television, Hitchcock's show was a solid hit, with Hitchcock directing the season's first two episodes starring Lawrence Harvey and James Donald. If North by Northwest was classic Hitchcock, the 1960 release Psycho was in a class by itself. Hitchcock's most famous and most profitable film had humble beginnings. Hitchcock was in pre-production of a film called No Bail for the Judge, but when its star Audrey Hepburn dropped out of the project, Hitchcock turned his attention to the novel about a serial killer written by Robert Block. Paramount wasn't happy with Hitchcock's choice. They felt the story was more horror than suspense. Hitchcock agreed to finance the project, and Paramount would distribute it. To save money, Hitchcock would film the picture at Universal's Review Studios, where Hitchcock's TV series was produced. The film was produced for under $800,000 and returned millions at the box office. Yet the film was blasted by the critics. The New York Times called Psycho a blot on an honorable career. But as the years passed, Psycho's influence on a new generation of filmmakers couldn't be denied. And even the film's toughest critics changed their minds. Hitchcock would later say, My films went from being failures to masterpieces. Good afternoon. Here we have a quiet little motel tucked away off the main highway and as you see, perfectly harmless looking when in fact it has now become known as the scene of the crime. This motel also has as an adjunct an old house, which is, if I may say so, a little more sinister looking, less innocent than the motel itself. And in this house, the most dire, horrible events took place. 
I think we can go inside because the place is up for sale. Although I don't know who's going to buy it now. In that window on the second floor, the single one in front, that's where the woman was first seen. Let's go inside. You see, even in daylight, this place still looks a bit sinister. Now, it was at the top of these stairs that the second murder took place. She came out of the door there and met the victim at the top. Of course, in a flash, there was the knife, and in no time, the victim tumbled and fell with a horrible crash. I think the bat broke immediately and hit the floor. It was it's difficult to describe the way that the, the, the twisting of the, of the, well, I, it's, uh, I won't dwell upon it, but let, let, come upstairs. Of course, the victim, or should I say victims, hadn't any conception as to the type of people they would be confronted with in this house, especially the woman. She was the weirdest and the most, well, well let's go into her bedroom. Here's the woman's room, still beautifully preserved. And the imprint of her figure on the bed where she used to lay. I think some of her clothes are still in this wardrobe. son's room but uh, we won't go in there because his favorite spot was the little parlor behind his office in the motel let's go down there this young man you had to feel sorry for him after all being dominated by an almost maniacal woman was enough to drive anyone to the extreme of uh, uh, well, let's go in. Well, I suppose you'd call this his hideaway. His hobby, as you see, was taxidermy. Crow here, an owl there. Now, an important scene took place in this room. There was a private supper here. And, uh, oh, by the way, this picture has great significance because uh, let's go along to cabin number one. I want to show you something there. All tied it up. bathroom. Well, they've cleaned all this up now. Big difference. You should have seen the blood. The whole, the whole place was, well, it's, it's too horrible to describe. Dreadful. And I'll tell you, there's a very important clue was found here. Down there. Well, the murderer, you see, crept in here very slowly. Of course, the shower was on, there was no sound. And, uh... Back on television, 
Hitchcock had become as famous and popular as any star. It made him the target of many comedians' jokes, like Jerry Lewis. Silhouette, here he comes, yes, here he comes, so Jerry Lewis is here. But Hitchcock's hosting antics were the icing on a very well-baked cake. Each week, his program consistently offered haunting stories and first-rate performances, like The Man from the South, starring Steve McQueen and Peter Lorre. The episode was used in this piece to promote the 1959-1960 season to network affiliates and sponsors. If you can make this celebrated lighter of yours work for you ten times without missing, ten times in succession, mind you, then the car is yours. Do I put up my spare set of pajamas? No. Look, I'm devoted to gambling, but I have never asked anybody to put up more than you can afford to lose. Hmm? What, for instance? Oh, I'm going to make it easy for you. Easy for you to win a car, I mean. Is that all right? I'm listening. I like the easy part. Well, I'm thinking of some small thing that you could afford to give away. And, and if you lose, well, you won't have to feel so bad, such as, such as the little thing on your left hand. My what? Is that so strange? He wins, he takes the car, I win, I take his finger. Is that so strange? Wow. I've been hanging around bar rooms half my life. I never heard anything like this before. Isn't it fair? Don't ask me, ask him. Now, what do you mean, if I lose, you take the finger? How else? I chopped it off. What? In March of 1960, Hitchcock directed Incident at a Corner, a one-hour special for NBC's Ford Star Time. It starred Vera Miles. In September of 1960, Alfred Hitchcock Presents moved to NBC, where it ran until 1962, except for one chilling episode. The Sorcerer's Apprentice, starring Brandon DeWilde and Diana Doors, written by Robert Block, is the only episode of the Hitchcock TV series the networks refused to run. My name is Hugo. Hugo what? Just Hugo. That's all they ever called me at the home. What kind of home is that, Hugo? Oh, it, it's a big place. I shouldn't have told you. The censors may have believed the story's depiction of a retarded boy, and the show's morbid conclusion was too much for network audiences. But the program was later broadcast in syndication. Are you ready? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen. Stop him. Stop him. He's hurting her. No, Hugo, it's only a trick. See? He's killed her! The devil's killed her! Calm down! is the wand, the magic wand. You're talking about? You told me yourself. Whoever has the wand has the power. Ladies 
and gentlemen, presenting Hugo the Great! I don't know quite how to put this. However, I must tell you the truth. The saw worked excellently, but the wand didn't. Hugo was terribly upset, and Irene was beside herself. As for the police, they misunderstood the whole thing and arrested Hugo for murder. In 1962, Hitchcock returned to CBS with a new one-hour version of his TV series. The unquestioned master of suspense, the magician of mystery, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock returns to CBS this fall on Thursdays with a brand new hour-long program. I hope you don't mind, but the new Hitchcock is twice as large as the old one. Therefore, certain adjustments have to be made. I wish to take this opportunity to say how excited we are at the prospects of doing an hour show and how pleased we all are to return to CBS. It is reassuring to labor once again under the steady, unblinking gaze of that giant eye. The Alfred Hitchcock Hour will be somewhat different from our half-hour show. In the first place, as a few of you may already have guessed, it will be twice as long. This will give us an opportunity to do things properly without rushing. A good murder, like good wine, takes time. I also strongly believe that the crime should fit the punishment. It is only reasonable that if a man is going to spend the rest of his life paying for a murder, he should be entitled to take his time while committing it. I don't wish to suggest that we should confine ourselves to this one sport, however. There are many other ways of achieving mystery and suspense, and with all this extra time on our hands, I'm certain we shall think of them. I believe that is all, except to say that I shall again be filling my role as host. Of course, although I am the host, I shall do my entertaining in your living room. That way I avoid all those drink stains on my rug and the cigarette burns on the upholstery. So, until next... Oh, well. He also released another record album, Ghost Stories for Young Children. On the movie front, Hitchcock knew it would take something special to top his last film, Psycho. The Birds, released in 1963, became Hitchcock's greatest technical challenge, and it required three years of pre-production. Hitchcock spent over $200,000 trying to create mechanical birds, but finally settled on using real birds, composite photography, and animation. The film's logistics were staggering, but Hitchcock remained in firm control because he had painstakingly pre-planned each shot, and his job didn't end in the editing room. As in so many of his productions, he took center stage in selling the film. It is about the birds and their age-long relationship with man. It will be seen in theaters like this across the country. This cave drawing is one of man's earliest sketches of his feathered friend. One can see at once the loving care with which the artist depicted his subject. The story of man and his friends, the birds, is filled with many fine examples of ways in which these noble creatures have added to the beauty of the world. Take this plumed hat from the period of Charles I. How proud the birds must have been to have their feathers plucked out to brighten man's drab life. Here we have a later model, a refinement of the first. Here man, or rather woman, thought enough of the birds to have an entire one as a decoration. It's quite dead, of course. Naturally, the egg plays a very prominent part in my lecture. Not a word about which came first, however. I don't believe in dealing with controversial matters. Thousands of years ago, man was satisfied merely to steal an egg from a nest and use it for food. 
Now he has perfected this process by imprisoning each hen in a separate cage and by scientifically manipulating the lights so that she doesn't fall into the rut of the old 24-hour day. Thus he can induce the bird to reach fantastic heights of egg production. Originally, there were many varieties of birds on Earth. Some have become extinct. The great auk, the passenger pigeon, and the famous dodo bird have all disappeared. Actually, they didn't exactly disappear. They were simply killed off. But of course, this is nature's way. Man merely hurries the process along whenever he can be of help. Man and birds have been responsible for a great many advances in our civilization. For example, the bird was the inspiration for the invention of gunpowder, and it was his speed that brought about the development of the shotgun. But man has not been unmindful of his debt to the bird. We have honored our feathered friends in many ways. We cage birds and show them off proudly in most of our zoos. And the turkey is traditionally our guest of honor at Thanksgiving. I suspect you never realize that if it weren't for birds, even some of our pastimes would suffer noticeably. Duck hunting, for example. Granted, bagging a fellow hunter can be diverting, but the supply is rather limited. I hope you don't mind if I have something to eat, but I'm rushed today. Planning the lecture has been most educational for me. I've begun to feel very close to the birds and have developed a real sympathy for our little... What was I saying? Oh yes, I've come to feel very close to the birds and have come to realize how they feel when... I don't think I'll eat just now. Hardly proper with all of you here. Surely the birds appreciate all we've done for them. Don't you? Beautiful cage, fresh water, no other birds to bother you, none of that blinding sunlight. Oh, now why would he do that? Most peculiar. What on earth? It wasn't only his films that Hitchcock promoted. Here he is selling viewers on his TV show and the rest of CBS's Fall 63 Friday Night lineup. How do you do? And welcome to the dead letter of The words piece de resistance keep occurring to me, no doubt because I'm getting hungry. Beginning in the fall, our program will be half an hour later than Modesty forbids my making any extravagant claims about the surprises and the suspense which will characterize our new stories. However, I hope you remember where to find the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Just follow the great adventure, take Route 66 until it ends, then proceed through the twilight zone. And there you are. The envelope, please. You have been captured by pirates. Go back to the great adventure and start over again. There must be someone in there. Yes, someone or something. I've always believed a firm hand clasp was the sign of an honest man. I hope that's true until the new season then. In 1964, Hitchcock exchanged his rights to Psycho and his TV series to MCA Universal for 150,000 shares of stock, making him the third largest shareholder in the company and a multimillionaire. It also assured him of total control over his film career for the rest of his life. Hitchcock's half-hour TV programs were so popular that CBS aired reruns in the afternoon, and Hitchcock, ever the willing pitchman, filmed new host segments for the shows. Good afternoon, ladies, and any gentlemen who may be malingering. Just make yourselves comfortable. We shall begin in a moment. 
Today we are bringing you our television album, Pictures to Iron By, together with a few long playing commercials. I wish to show you that murder, like romance, can flourish as well in the daylight as at night. It's all a matter of one's attitude. As you know, this is part of a series. I have three other towels just like it. And now for our program. Naturally, we shall steadfastly maintain our customary policy. Justice to all criminals, but no mercy to the sponsor. The wisdom of this double standard will be demonstrated by the following. I simply couldn't sit still another minute. I had to get to work. I'm sure you know the feeling. I'm equally sure that when the house is empty and no one is watching, you ladies occasionally use the banister as a means of getting from place to place more speedily. Naturally, I do too. I shall continue this conversation in a moment. I hope. That was exhilarating. The somersault at the end was especially thrilling. I'm sorry that commercial intervened, for I think you would have enjoyed watching. This concludes today's matinee. I hope you will join us next time. Until then, good day. How do you do? I am Alfred Hitchcock, and I would like to tell you about my latest motion picture, Marnie, which will be coming to this theater soon. Marnie is a very difficult picture to classify. It is not psycho, nor do we have a horde of birds flapping about and pecking at people willy-nilly. We do have two very interesting human specimens, a man and a woman. One might call Marnie a sex mystery, that is, if one used such words. But it is more than that. Perhaps the best way to tell you about the picture is to show you a few scenes. The 1964 release Marnie is a strangely controversial Hitchcock film. Many think it's one of his worst, a technically flawed and muddy film, while others say it's complex and richly textured, with similarities to Spellbound and Notorious. The film may have also suffered from comparison to Hitchcock's two previous nail-biters, Psycho and The Birds. Tippi Hedren, who had just starred in The Birds, returns as Hitchcock's heroine, and Sean Connery, in a complete change of pace from his first two James Bond films, plays the male lead. That's right, you are. And I've caught something really wild this time, haven't I? I've tracked you and caught you, and by God, I'm going to keep you. As for which one of them is the wild animal, there are times when I'm not sure. I don't think that was necessary. Actually, I think I should withhold comment, since I'm not certain I understand this scene. I shall leave the explanation to your own vivid imagination. In making a motion picture like Marnie, one must be as careful as the most fastidious of chefs. Marnie was a very complex person. She was a thief, a liar, and a cheat and yet there was something about her that made her different from the rest of us. That is the secret ingredient. In making the motion picture Marnie, I first added this secret ingredient and stirred well. Then I added some suspense. And then, just a dash of sex. That's exactly the way it happened last time. Turned out to be rather interesting. 1964 saw the final year of Alfred Hitchcock's television series with a one-hour version airing on NBC. What a haunting hour. <laughs> Join Alfred Hitchcock at 10, 9 central time. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Charlie, how many times is he going to say good, good evening? evening? Hitchcock's last good evening came on May 10, 1965. 
ending a remarkable 10-year run. Of course, the program has hardly been off the air, as it's enjoyed great success in syndication. Of special interest are these rarely seen color wraparounds Hitchcock filmed for later syndication. Good evening. Film festivals are much in vogue these days. They have become quite a popular pastime. It occurred to me that it might be enjoyable to have one of my own. I have blackmailed this station into re-showing some of my favorite little gems of crime and punishment. Tonight we offer the crime on Alfred Hitchcock Presents and leave the punishment to you. Good evening. My astrologer tells me there is a right and wrong time for everything. Since Mercury is in the house of Venus, now is a propitious time for the retelling of tales of mystery and suspense. Do not defy your horoscope. The stars tell me you are tuned in perfectly for the tale now coming up, which will be introduced by my younger brother. In 1965, David O. Selznick, the man who brought Alfred Hitchcock to America, died. Hitchcock, along with many stars like Cary Grant, sadly attended the funeral. Just how far Hitchcock had come since his arrival in America could be seen with the 1965 re-release of Psycho, which earned an incredible $5 million. With subsequent theatrical revivals and later TV and video, Psycho has become one of the most profitable black and white films of all time. Nineteen sixty six saw the release of Hitchcock's fiftieth film, Torn Curtain, the Cold War spy thriller, seen troubled from the start, beginning with what the New York Times called a cliche ridden script. Hitchcock's two stars, Julie Andrews and Paul Newman, were so expensive that production elements of the film had to be scaled back. Hitchcock's biggest problem was with Paul Newman. Newman, a method actor, constantly clashed with Hitchcock on the set, often refusing to obey Hitchcock's direction. Now you stay away from me. Don't talk to me. Go home. At the 1968 Academy Award ceremony, Alfred Hitchcock received the Irving Thalberg Award. Hitchcock's entire acceptance speech consisted of, Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. For the 1969 release, Topaz, Hitchcock wanted to return to movie making on a grand scale. He cast less expensive actors in exchange for international locations and expensive Hollywood sets. Topaz was adopted from Leon Uris' novel about the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. When Uris' screenplay arrived, Hitchcock found it unacceptable, but he was already locked into production dates. He flew over another screenwriter and began rewrites, with new scenes often being delivered just hours before shooting. Does the word Topaz mean anything to you? What is Topaz? Topaz is a story of espionage in high places. You'll see men and women caught up in the vortex of international tensions. With a $4 million budget, Topaz became Hitchcock's biggest American film failure. If you want to know what really goes on behind the headlines, I suggest you see Topaz. In 1971, Hitchcock returned to London to direct the 1972 release, Frenzy. After a 20-year absence, the return to his native soil seemed to revive his creative energy. Another necktie murder. <laughs> you think this is a tie, don't you? Actually, it's a murder weapon used to strangle women in frenzy. The film also returns Hitchcock to familiar themes like the wrongly accused man and the cast against type villain. It was also Hitchcock's most violent film and his only R-rated picture. Of course, it also has touches of humor, but even Hitchcock admitted his cameo appearance floating down the Thames was a bit much. The footage was used later for promotion only. I am on the famous Thames River investigating a murder. For Hitchcock's 53rd film, the 1976 release Family Plot, Hitchcock was able to assemble many of his favorite production personnel, including cameraman Leonard South, and costume designer Edith Head. During the filming, the 75-year-old director suffered a heart attack and a pacemaker was installed. After recovering, Hitchcock delighted in telling his actors, my batteries are fully charged. And so was Hitchcock, bringing the film in on time. The shooting took less than 60 days and under budget. Bruce Dern said, I've never worked with anyone who proceeded so methodically. 
He's also the best actor I've ever worked with. Family Plot premiered at the 1976 Filmex Festival, and the only question was, will Hitchcock make another film? Hitchcock had no doubt, and immediately began work with writer Ernest Lehman on a film called The Short Night, based on a British spy case. But Hitchcock's health was failing. In May of 1979, just two months after receiving the American Film Institute's Life Achievement Award, Hitchcock closed his production office at Universal. The following year, on April 20th, 1980, Alfred Hitchcock died. He was 80 years old. Hitchcock's obituary in Variety said, The real miracle of Hitchcock's career was that he was a master showman who also managed to create great art which invites and withstands endless investigation. His status as the master not only refers to his own command over his material, but to the degree which he taught so many other directors. Hitchcock once said, Some films are slices of life. Mine are slices of cake. And what a rich dessert he's left us, including one of his most endearing legacies, the Hitchcock cameo. Beginning in 1926 for The Lodger, he appeared in most of his 53 films. The first film you could recognize him in was the 1929 Blackmail. Eventually, appearances became so eagerly awaited that Hitchcock had to keep pushing his cameos earlier in the film so the audience wouldn't become distracted looking for him. As we watch some of Hitchcock's memorable cameos, they remind us of his truly remarkable career. can remember the words of Ernest Lehman who said in his eulogy, how reassuring it's been that for practically all our lives to have been in the lap, in the hands, under the spell of this giant, this genius, this gentleman. Hitch, what happens next? The foregoing has made it obvious to me that we've had quite enough for one evening. Good night. <laughs>